In part eight of this series, I want to go over some of those key things you want to check when you go inspect a 10 to 15 year old Mercedes Benz. As I got into this video and I began to think about all the things I normally check when I go look at these cars, I realized, man, the list is like huge. And there's no way that I could cover this in a short video. So what I've decided to do is just touch on what I feel are the five, the five most important things you want to check or inspect during that first visit to look at a car that you're considering buying. And before you take off on this trip, there's a few things you should take along with you and I'll explain why. For one thing, you want a good flashlight. I mean, you're gonna be looking under the car, you're gonna be looking around the engine compartment and it's really handy to have a flashlight. You'll want to be, of course, take gloves with you and paper towels. And if the car is less than perfect or it has been having some problems or some issues and the owner is trying to unload it, then you need to take your inspection support kit. Now I call this a support kit because this is the one where you may have to get down on your hands and knees, get down and dirty. And it would include, first of all, bringing some sort of a pad to lay on the ground with so you can get under the car and take a close look at the undercarriage. I like this hardboard. I mean, it's great. It's very slippery. You can get on it and just slide right under the car. In lieu of that, you can take cardboard or you can use a plastic tarp, but, but take some sort of a ground protector so you can get on your knees, get under the car and inspect all around underneath the vehicle that you're going to look at. Then you want, might want to consider taking a battery or a booster with you. Uh, you and there's been numerous times I've gone to look at a car only to get there and the owner says, oh, sorry, it won't start. Or, oh, the battery went dead last night because I left the door, uh, the dome light on. And that's really frustrating, particularly if you've driven a long distance and you're thinking, man, there's no way I'm going to buy this car unless I can hear the engine run and take it for a test drive. So normally on my trips, I, I just grab my trusty booster or if the owner has said the car is not starting or is having a difficult time starting, then go ahead and take a battery with you. And then finally, you might want to consider taking a jack and some jack stands. This will allow you to get the car off the ground a little bit, particularly some models like this E320 wagon, where you want to inspect the formatic front axles and you want to check real close for torn boots, leaks, and so on. This wagon sits pretty close to the ground. And if the hydraulic suspension hasn't been utilized in quite a while, it could be even sitting lower in the rear end. So being able to just jack the car up a little bit, get some jack stands under it, will allow you to get under the car and really take a close look. And, and of course, the obvious thing is take some hand tools with you. You know, don't go off on these trips without some sort of little toolbox that has your basic screwdrivers, sockets, uh, and so on. So now, now with that out of the way, you've got your inspection kit, so to speak, as you head out on your little hunt for your new Mercedes. I want to talk about those five key things to check when you get there. But before I do that, I should, I should mention a couple other things that you'll want to take with you. Um, these are my two favorite. A lot of people don't take these, they don't even have these. The first thing is a little code reader. You'd be amazed to find uh, what you might, you know, see in these cars when you go look at them. I mean, there could be hidden codes that aren't even showing on the check engine light. Or if the owner has reported that there is a check engine light on, then, then you can at least plug in the code reader and get some codes to see. Maybe it's a catalytic converter and that could be very expensive to replace, uh, or maybe it's an oxygen sensor, uh, maybe it's a loose gas cap, but it's really good to have a simple code reader along. And then I personally like to take my engine oil and transmission oil inspection kit. I've developed this from going on numerous trips to look at these cars and you know, there's no easy way to get in and even look at the transmission fluid. And the dipstick, if you have one of those factory dipsticks, you can't even see the fluid on the end. So how are you going to really inspect it? But with this kit right here, you can take a small amount of fluid out of the transmission and out of the engine and really inspect it. In a future video, I'll talk about this kit in detail and go over how you use it. And in a few weeks, this will be available for purchase on my website, along with complete instructions on how to inspect the Seal for Life transmissions 
as well as how to change the transmission fluid. Okay, with that aside, let's talk about those five key things. I failed to mention a couple of no-nos, and that is do not go look at a car when it's raining, and do not go look at a car at night. Uh, I, I unfortunately have to talk from personal experience. You can't believe <laughs> the times I have gotten the car home and I suddenly see something that I didn't know was there. So just, you know, word of the wise there. If you can all avoid it, do not go look at a car in the rain and, if, and just don't even schedule something after dark. Okay, on with, on with these five key things. Let's say you've just arrived at the scene of your car. Okay, this E320 wagon here, I'm really interested in buying it. The first thing is the owner is going to come walking out and he's going to want to talk your ear off. This could be very challenging because he wants to tell you everything about the car, how wonderful it is. I just love it. And it's, oh yeah, the engine's perfect. Oh, the body's perfect. Oh man, this has been the greatest car since I've ever owned. And on and on and on. And what you need to do is you need to focus. And it's really hard to focus and concentrate on what you're looking at if the owner's sitting there jabbering away. So what I do, and I know it may appear to be a little rude, but you need to, when you arrive, say, look, I, I'm very familiar with these cars. I just need a few minutes to look at the car very carefully. And if it passes my initial inspection, then I'll come back and we'll take it for a test drive. Because they, they want to get in and start it up. And you know, oh wow, listen to this thing run, you know. And while the engine's running, they're trying to talk to you and you're thinking, oh man, I need to check this car out. So kind of plan ahead how you'll do this. Just let the owner go back into the house. If he's just wanting to go take a coffee break, uh, that's the ideal situation. So then you can go around the car and inspect these five things very carefully without any distraction. Now what I do is I, 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 get to, I get to the location, I look at the car, and I do a walk around. Because there's no sense in you know, going on a test drive and wasting his time, wasting your time, if it doesn't even pass the simple visual inspection. And by visual inspection, I mean a walk around. And when I do a walk around on a car like this E320, I'm looking for a few things. Right away, I'm looking for any evidence of body damage or repaint. And I'm also at the same time looking for any evidence of rust. And as I walk down this front fender, I see this very slight dent. Now this isn't a deal killer, but you'd be amazed how much they would charge to repair that in a body shop. So don't be fooled by just small dents. I think this, this might be a good candidate for one of those uh, paintless dent repair guys. But can you imagine if it were raining or it were dark? you would not even see this dent. And I bet you can't even see it in <laughs> this scene here. So we're gonna have to move in close to kind of get a shot of this. But I, what I do is I'm quickly looking at all the gap lines. The gap lines between the doors, between the doors and the fenders. And when you see inconsistent gap lines, it's a good indication either that door or that panel has been replaced. The other thing you're looking for and this takes some experience. You're looking for inconsistencies in not just the color, but the surface texture of the paint. You know, the factory uses these water-based paints and they, have, they tend to have quite a bit of orange peel. And by orange peel, I mean roughness. And usually if a body shop repaints a fender or a hood on one of these cars, you'll see the difference. In other words, the new paint may be a little bit smoother than the factory paint. So keep an eye on that. Also, you can look underneath the car and look for any evidence of overspray, like down under the bumper or, or under the fender, because a lot of body shops, they won't mask off under there. And you get down low and you can see where a spray gun has gone under and painted some parts under, underneath the car. So that's kind of another thing you want to watch. You know, I mentioned in the uh, previous videos why I don't like to buy cars that have been repainted or damaged. So, but that's your call. Now, as far as rust, we'll do that in, the, in one of the other ones where we have to get out of the car. But, you know, you look around the quarter panels, the jack points, some of the obvious places where you might uh, find evidence of rust are like here on this car, you can see it on the gas door. Well, if it's showing up on the gas door, you better believe there's going to be rust in a lot of other places as well. And I get down and I look down the side of the car. You can tell, you know, looking right down the side of the panel, you can look for door dings. And a lot of times you'll see, you know, a wavy panel where there's been some body work done. So I'll go all the way around the car. Of course, I'm going to open 
while I do this, I'm going to open and look inside at the interior just, interior just quickly. And then, of course, close every door just to see how they close. A lot of time, a body damaged car will have doors that won't have that solid click thunk like you hear on Mercedes Benz. So, once you've gone around and done your body paint and rust inspection, then it's time to go in. Okay, we've covered number one, which was body and paint. And at the same time, I'm glancing around inside just to check the general condition of the interior. And then number two, rust. Um, you know, rust is a real deal killer for me. You've heard me say this before. So I'm going to get uh, I'm going to get a car up on a lift here and show you what they should really look like underneath. Of course, in this scene, you can see this car here, Mercedes. It's obviously been subjected to road salt, and this is only minor road salt. Some of the cars in Europe and other parts of the country just get terribly rusty, and that's a deal killer for me. I just tell the guy, hey, sorry, not interested in your car, and I head off down the road. But if it kind of passes number one and number two, then I come to number three, which is fluids. And these can be real deal killers for me because what you're looking for is evidence of maintenance preventative maintenance I'm talking about. And that comes down to engine oil, transmission fluid, coolant, and brake fluid. And, and I, if, for instance, right now I'm working on a kit that we'll offer on our website. It's not done yet, so don't ask. But I really want, along with my fluid inspection kit, I want to have some test strips so that you can, uh, you can go and just dip it in the, in the brake fluid, dip it in the coolant, and I'll have some inspection uh, pads that you can inspect the transmission fluid and the engine oil for heavy oxidation. But that's coming. That's something I want to be able to offer people because you want to really check this closely, particularly on these uh, newer Mercedes with the sealed for life transmissions. So the first thing I do is I come in, I just take the oil cap off. Imagine, you'd be amazed at how, what you can see and determine from the oil cap. Now, not only on the cap itself, but looking down in the area here to see how clean it is gives you a really good idea how often this car has received oil changes. This is what it should look like right here. This is a car that has 130,000 miles. Now, take a look at this other one. This is what it should not look like. Once I check that, I'll come over and pull the dipstick and I'll have a little, uh, if you don't have my a fluid inspection kit, you can just get a paper towel, pull the dip, dipstick out, and let a few drips drip on the paper towel, and then kind of inspect the coloring. And this is a whole subject on its own. In, in a later video, I'm going to carefully go over the procedures for particularly checking the condition of the engine oil and the transmission fluid. Then I'll go over to the, um, the coolant uh, reservoir tank, take the cap off, look down into that coolant, make sure there's no evidence of, of oil in there. If there's any oil floating on the surface, that's a deal breaker. <laughs> Just that coolant needs to be super clean. And then finally, the transmission. Now this is where it gets really challenging because these transmissions are sealed. I'm looking at this transmission, I can see the locking tab for the seal cap has been broken off, so somebody's gotten in there. You're going to need a dipstick and, and a way to get that, some of that fluid out of there. And of course, that's what my, my kit over here is for. And um, you can kind of, you know, if you have to buy, I hate to have to go out and buy these factory dipsticks that are, you know, $70, $80. And you can get some aftermarket ones in the $20, $30, $40 range. But uh, the dipstick doesn't give you, you know, a really good indication because you can only get a little bit of transmission fluid on the end of that dipstick and you can hardly even see it. So since most people have never had this fluid change because the dealer told them it didn't need to be changed, when you go looking at these cars, transmission fluid becomes one of the key things you want to check because replacing a transmission is very expensive. If you're talking about $3,500 uh, for a rebuild, for an independent mechanic to replace, if you go to the dealer, it's going to be seven to eight thousand dollars to get a factory remand. So, you don't want to be buying these cars with bad transmissions unless you're getting them really, really cheap. Okay, so we've checked the fluid over. 
once again, you can see already how long this video is. I can't, just covering, just covering checking these fluids is, a, is an entire video in itself, and the transmission fluid is even a longer video than any of the other ones I might do. So just be looking for some of these videos in the future, which I will go into these things in more detail. But briefly, if you find super dirty engine oil, super dirty in here, transmission fluid, smell it. If it smells burnt, forget it. Because you're probably going to find out that the brake fluid over here, when you open up the cap, is dark in color. Remember, this brake fluid should be changed every year, at least every two years. And you're going to get over there and open up the coolant, and you're going to see the coolant looks dirty. And at that point, you know, I hate to say it, but walk. There's plenty of, of good cars out there, and you don't need to buy one that has dirty old fluid in the engine. Okay, now that you've checked the condition of the fluids, number four is looking for fluid leaks. This is extremely important. If you have major engine oil leaks or major transmission leaks leaking out of seals, some of these repairs can be very expensive and they can be very difficult for the, you know, the beginner or intermediate DIY mechanic. So I like to get down on my hands and knees. This is once again where you might want to have a jack, but you're going to be looking uh, you know, I like to kind of go back here. I, I'm not going to show it here, but I'll start in the back here. Now you're seeing this car on a lift because there's no way I can get under here and film. But you want to start at the back end. You're looking for exhaust leaks. You're looking for rear end, rear, rear end leaks, rear axle boot leaks, and you're moving forward. Moving forward. Look at this car. Look at how clean this car is. This is an E430 with 160,000 miles on it. And I find this quite amazing compared to some of the older models that you might look at with this model. There's virtually no leaks on this car. And moving up through the transmission and into the engine compartment, there's maybe just a couple minor places of wetness. And notice, I mentioned earlier about rust. This is where you're kind of getting under there and you're looking, you're looking for not only leaks with your flashlight, but you're looking for rust. And you're going from the back to the front and you're checking every area. And you're going to have to weigh, you know, okay, I see some transmission leaks, I see some engine leaks. Once again, that's going to be part of the formula as to whether you want to buy the car at all or whether you want to tell the owner about the leaks and then negotiate a lower price. Number five on my list is electrical. You know, these, these cars are loaded full of electrical gadgets and computers, and you want to make sure everything's working. Everything because each thing that's not working, you know, is going to cost you money, so you better be able to use it to negotiate the price. Like I got, I got into this uh, E320 wagon and started checking, got in the car, you know, sit in the driver's seat. If, you know, if you have to get the owner's manual out and start figuring out how to check all the power windows, all the power mirrors, you know, the climate control, make sure the air conditioning is working, make sure the, all the lights are working, on and on it goes. Now this could be the longest part of this five part check and you haven't even done a road trip yet. So you can see that if you run it, you know, if you got check engine, let's say you got a check engine light, well get the code reader and plug in that code reader and start checking the codes because, you know, once again, some of those problems could be very expensive to fix. If you have clear codes, you have no malfunction showing on the dash, uh, that's a really good sign. Then you can move on to a lot of these other electrical things. And, and, you know, like, for instance, I found out this rear window wasn't working, so I came back here, and look, guess what? Sure enough, a failed rear window regulator. Now, what's that going to cost? Not too bad if you do it yourself, but if you were to take this into a dealer to have this rear window repaired, it would be five to $600. So this is another good example why if you're going to own these cars and go out and buy them used with 100 to 120,000, 30,000 miles, you better be prepared to learn how to do some of the work yourself. So the story on this one is, yeah, I went around it. Almost everything worked on the car except this rear window. I had a, a broken rear side window that got hit with a uh, weed whacker rock. So there's a couple minor things I'm going to have to, to fix. But this car passed my test, and I decided to bring it home. So let's conclude by talking about what I did not cover in this video. 
Now I think you can understand why I was lamenting the fact that I wasn't going to be able to cover everything in a video. We haven't even done the road uh, test yet, and there's a bunch more things you could check on this car. So I just felt that I needed to hit on these five key things because at that point, if, they, if those don't pass, then it's time to just get in the car and drive away. No, no reason to go on a road test, and of course, no reason to negotiate, and that's a, a totally different topic. I may even do a, a, a future video on road tests and another one on the art of negotiation for the best deal. So I hope you found that helpful. Just a couple of, of parting comments as we wrap this one up. You probably noticed that the engine compartment in this E320 wagon was pretty clean. Well, I'm going to get on my high horse here a little bit because uh, I've been out over the last few months, probably looked at 25 to 30 of these 10 to 15 year old Mercedes, and guess what? I haven't seen one reasonably clean engine compartment. Come on, people. Um, I can't believe that people are actually trying to sell their car with a dirty engine compartment. This engine compartment was pretty dirty, but look at it now. It looks pretty nice. And you might say, well, what's a big deal about a clean engine compartment? Well, first of all, if the engine's clean, it shows that the owner cares. Um, and then, of course, when you go to work on it, it's much easier to work on. You know, I see some of these YouTube videos where guys are doing oil changes and filter changes on their car, and their engine is absolutely filthy. And, you know, they're whipping the air cleaner out and shaking on the air cleaner box and throwing the new air cleaner on and slapping it back on, and, and they're pulling their uh, oil filter out and uh, dirty housing, and they're wiping it off and shoving another oil filter in and screwing it back. Oh, no, we're ready to go. Well, can you imagine how much damage that just did to the engine? Injecting oil, uh, dirt into the intake manifold or adding a little bit of grit into the engine oil? So having a clean engine will help extend its life. And it also makes it much more pleasant to work on. Come on, you got to admit that working on a clean engine is like coming into a clean house. It just gives you more of a feeling of, hey, I really want to work on this thing. So. You're probably thinking, well, I don't want to clean my engine. I might ruin some of those computers. Well, I have a technique, and I've shot a, a complete video. This will be vi available later this summer on my website on how to clean and detail these engines that have a lot of electronics and a lot of computers and, and to do it in a way that you won't harm them. Because granted, you can't just come in there with a pressure washer or a big hose at one of these car washes and start spraying down your engine. So that, I know, it sounds like I'm on my high horse here, but... Uh, let's, let's look at clean engines here, particularly if you're going to start doing the maintenance on them yourself. Now, I'm going to say that it is a challenge to get out there on the road and check these cars out, but, uh, you know, it might be worth it. Uh, if you knew what I paid for this E320 wagon here, you would go, my, oh, my. So happy hunting, everyone.